thank you all very much for, for coming out to uh, hear me, especially as I realize uh, it's April 1st, and I might very well have come here with a picture of a jelly donut and said, that's the edges against the middle. <laughs> But I wasn't clever enough to think of a long, uh, drawn-out joke in advance, and so uh, instead I'm going to give you uh, the, uh, the the presentation that uh, I've described here, and I want to start out with uh, some pictures of the, the problem in the middle. Uh, so here is the block screen that you might see if you were trying to browse the internet. Uh, from an internet cafe in Tehran, Iran, trying to access some political content that uh, the regime had uh, found um, impolitic. And you wouldn't get to the page you were looking for, you'd get uh, this access okay, it's denied. Just a test. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the, the response to, to anything we're saying here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're told that this is uh, state censored. If you think this site is incorrectly blocked, please press the submit button. Um, on the other hand, if you are actually trying to get to uh, a page from the Green Movement's opposition organizing, uh, you might well not want to press the submit button and announce that you are trying to, to visit forbidden content. Um, and you can see these pages around the region. Uh, here is one from Qatar. Uh, <laughs> Taking a bit more of the humorous approach to it. Um, this one's uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, each of these regimes has uh, its own view of what is permitted content and what's uh, forbidden to, to their citizens. And uh, they've enacted those views by pressuring the internet service providers through whom the country gets access uh, to the broader internet to insert these block pages. If you're using internet from any of the uh, major carriers um, in many uh, Middle Eastern countries, you'll find that what you get is only a subset of the internet. Pieces of it are uh, blocked or censored out um, through pressure on uh, the service providers necessary to make those connections. Uh, the Berkman Center has just come out with uh, a report showing that many of these sensors are in fact using United States technologies to implement their censorship. They're purchasing uh, materials designed for uh, or offered in one U.S. market as help your school to stay clean of <laughs> Uh, family unfriendly materials, uh, tweak a different set of block lists and you get help your country to stay clean of dissidents. Um, so that, that's one approach. Um, here's another. Um, browsing the web from China, um, you might get your connection reset while trying to access forbidden content such as uh, Reporters Without Borders, uh, trying to re report in, on situations of uh, human rights reporting in China. Try to access the BBC, try to uh, do a web search on Tiananmen Square, and you will simply find uh, your connection reset. They send a reset packet uh, to your machine, and uh, you can't browse for uh, a period of time until uh, the, the connection comes back up. And maybe next time you're a little bit less likely to do those uh, searches that might get you in trouble. The Chinese also have uh, an extensive uh, scheme of social pressure. Uh, so these here are uh, Jing Jing and Cho Cho, uh, the Chinese internet cops, who are part of a PR campaign to get people to think uh, more properly about the harmonious society that they are supposed to be uh, part of and that they're supposed to be enacting on the internet as well as uh, elsewhere. Uh, so before you post uh, to your blog or your micro blog or your social network from China, uh, you're supposed to think of these internet cops who might be watching uh, and might take issue uh, at what you're posting. And the scheme of social control is uh, implemented throughout the network. Rebecca McKinnon, uh, working with the Berkman Center, uh, has done a terrific series of reports on the, the, the pressures on 
individual web hosts and blogging service providers who um, are told that they too are responsible for harmonizing their portion of the internet uh, and uh, that they should remove posts that are talking about forbidden political events, they should uh, remove posts talking about the uh, tainted milk scandals or uh, about government's failure to respond uh, in disaster zones. Um, and because each of the providers implements that differently, there might be some places where the post is allowed through and some places where the, the very same post is blocked. I'm curious, do they only uh, filter content traversing the their border offers of their country or even things that are within? Um, both. Uh, so the, the reset packets um, are most often at the borders, uh, but these re uh, internet service providers told to police their own content uh, are those posting content primarily within the country. Uh, so that the all of the major content posts and microblogging platforms because uh, China has the equivalents to Twitter and to Facebook uh, Q, on QQ and other services. Um, each of them is told, you are responsible for, uh, for the content that users post there. Um, and um, sometimes even uh, uh, official government pronouncements have been posted and then censored because the censors looking at this aren't sure whether it's something that's permitted or something that should be forbidden uh, without looking uh, at its source. Uh, so uh, this unpredictability uh, then creates a chilling effect on the individuals who are thinking of posting. If you're thinking about uh, posting and you want to talk uh, politics, but you also want your post to stay online. Maybe you're content with posting it very briefly and hoping that the offline social networks uh, will, or will spread it after that uh, or mirror it. But um, if you're more cautious, don't want to get yourself in trouble, uh, you might stay well back of the line of forbidden content because you don't know, you don't have a bright line of what's forbidden and what's permitted. Uh, so that uh, has uh, what we know in U.S. law as a chilling effect on discourse. It's not the direct uh, of impact of the law, but uh, the shadow of the law and its enforcement mechanisms. Uh, here's another type of uh, recent uh, censorship of perhaps the most dramatic kind. This is Renesis' picture of uh, traffic into Egypt uh, and the reachability of uh, Egypt networks on uh, January 27th when, uh, as we know, Egypt told all of the internet service providers, stop. Uh, you're forbidden from permitting traffic to transit uh, out of the country. And that meant both that people inside the country couldn't get uh, out and that those of us watching from outside the country could no longer reach um, AS uh, networks inside of Egypt. Uh, so dramatic shutdown. Um, and all of these, I think, illustrate that uh, our simple picture um, of the internet cloud as a, a reliable place for storage and uh, a direct connection, usually, I mean, at least from the on the policy side, we often think we don't really need to think about what's in there and how traffic will get from point to point. We can just assume that this cloud will work. Um, looking at uh, censorship examples uh, shows us uh, that that's not true, that we in fact need to pay lots more attention uh, to the points in the middle uh, and to the way that each of those points can be used to exercise control. Uh, so instead of uh, the, the open and airy cloud, at times, uh, sensors see the attractive choke points um, and find ways that are technological, political, uh, or social to close the, uh, our access. Uh, and sometimes, uh, as I mentioned, they are aided by uh, 
United States and, and Western providers of technology uh, whose packet shaping technologies are uh, of great use in shaping uh, packets for uh, all sorts of purposes. Technology is agnostic. Sometimes it gets used for uh, good traffic shaping, uh, but good can vary depending on whom you are uh, talking to and what they're trying to achieve with it. Uh, so, so far this sounds uh, relatively bleak, but um, as John Gilmore famously said, uh, the internet perceives censorship as damage and routes around it. And society is also pretty good at routing around uh, these censorship mechanisms. And people find ways of communicating uh, despite blockages in the center of the internet. Uh, so um, among Chinese citizens uh, trying to uh, get around forbidden subjects, um, they sometimes use images. Um, and so this one's what I've been shown. Um, the watch, uh, the, the cra river crab sounds like uh, or shares syllables uh, with the word for harmonization. And because uh, they uh, use uh, the harmonization to refer to the censorship or to create a harmonious society, um, the image of the river crab uh, is a way to remark, I've been censored, uh, without saying that outright, and perhaps to make it a little bit more difficult for the censors to find this commentary on their activity uh, and remove that. Uh, it's, so they develop increasingly complex codes uh, to talk about uh, the issues that, uh, the, that are officially forbidden. Uh, because uh, language is adaptable and images are adaptable and, uh, and we find ways to, uh, to get around uh, that block. Um, what about Egypt? Their internet uh, was cut off, but um, people found, started to post and offer workarounds to that. Uh, internet service providers outside of Egypt offered anyone who still had a dial-up modem uh, sitting around uh, free dial-in lines to uh, dial up to, uh, in this case, a French ISP uh, offering access to um, Egyptian citizens tr trying to report from the protests in Tahrir Square. Uh, if you could, and of course most of them couldn't see this post on Twitter directly, but uh, Jacob Applebaum's uh, idea in posting this was to share it with enough people that somebody w would hear it close enough to uh, those who were trying to reach the internet. A few people uh, would find this on Twitter and uh, be able to uh, start communicate again. Did, did Egypt also cut um, the providers' internet connections? A little bit after the um, after cutting off the, the internet connections, so they, they, they put pressure on all of the uh, the cell carriers um, and the and even the big multinational carriers like Vodafone uh, heard this and uh, shut off their service. But telephone lines were never cut off. So if you have a landline and, and a modem, um, you could get access uh, to the internet this way. Uh, Google and uh, partners offered up the, the service Speak to Tweet, uh, that if you had access to a landline and uh, wanted to report on uh, political uprising, uh, you could call into various numbers that they posted um, and uh, record a message that volunteers on the other end would transcribe, put a hashtag in, and put back into uh, streams on Twitter. They post to Twitter under the Speak to Tweet uh, address. Uh, and so that we, watching from outside, could find, uh, could get much closer to the action there and follow uh, what was happening as uh, the Egyptian government uh, under Mubarak first uh, insisted that it was holding strong, 
then changed out its ministers while saying that uh, Mubarak will remain in power, uh, and then finally uh, fled under the, the political protest. Now, of course, most of that protest was people in the square uh, standing up directly to uh, police authority. Uh, but they were able to find ways to use this network to communicate despite the interests of, uh, uh, of the Mubarak regime in cutting them off. How was the traditional media censored simultaneously? Or was there any censorship of you know, CNN, Fox, or whatever? Um, well, from the reports I saw, lots of journalists were um, imprisoned or stopped from gaining access to the area. Um, Al Jazeera was given the most uh, effective window uh, for us outside into what was going on. Um, and I think the media inside Egypt has been pretty heavily censored. Some people had sort of clandestine satellite dishes that they were able to point to uh, signals like Al Jazeera's. Uh, and while Al Jazeera had its offices burned and uh, faced lots of pressure to, to tone down its reporting, uh, they, they continued to, uh, to push out images and video. Uh, but I think you're, you're right to point out that the internet was just a piece of the media that was being Well, yeah, I'm actually in the back of my mind wondering if this is, this is just the fact that we're talking about this here and even Google cares about this so much. Is this a testament to the fact that people are now kind of are losing faith in traditional media and want to hear directly from the people? That even if CNN and whoever might not have been blocked, um, just the fact that the internet was blocked was so unnerving that we really wanted to hear from the ground right from the people's mouths. Is that is that an accurate characterization? I think I think you're right. That and. It's part of the sort of general trend of our sort of mainstream media have been cutting back on their foreign desks and their reporting uh, to us here on events throughout the Middle East. So given a chance uh, be, of, of an Egypt report wedged in five minutes between uh, other important breaking news on CNN, uh, the latest celebrity uh, fight uh, or whatever that might have been, uh, versus the real stream of traffic coming out on uh, social networks. Andy Carvin of NPR uh, was doing a terrific job of curating the tweets that were coming together and reposting them, sometimes saying, I'm just retweeting. I can't verify whether this is true or false, uh, but helping people outside to form a picture of what was happening. But um, some of mainstream media was also limited because of the lack of access to things like the internet and to you know cellular um, towers and and even satellite, right? So even then, so uh, mm -hmm. even if they were going to report, they didn't have access. That's right. And that was uh, part of this sort of stated explanation of why Egypt cut off. Uh, its internet. It didn't want outside media coming in and reporting. Uh, it also said it didn't want um, uh, its citizens being able to communicate with the outside world. Um, as somebody pointed out, though, uh, if you wanted people to stay out of the square protesting, turning off their internet connection so that they, the only thing they had to do uh, in order to find people was to go out into the square and uh, talk face to face, was probably counterproductive. Um, and um, as we know, the Mubarak regime did not uh, last. Um, another tool in the uh, fight against censorship, uh, I work with the Tor Project, which started out as uh, an anonymity uh, network and uh, software uh, that Tor works by uh, routing your connection uh, encrypted in, uh, wrapped in uh, layers of encryption, routing it through uh, three separate nodes, each of which uh, unwraps uh, one layer of the onion and uh, forwards it on uh, so that the computer 
uh, receiving your traffic doesn't know who sent it. Uh, and the entry node, which knows who you are, doesn't know where you're trying to go. Uh, so, so the network is resistant to uh, traffic analysis. And it's resistant to compromise by uh, malicious nodes in the middle, somebody in the middle who determines that uh, he doesn't want to, to cooperate, uh, doesn't have enough information to unmask a person and uh, where he or she is trying to go. Um, apart from the problem that Tor can't encrypt the internet, uh, so if you're making a connection to uh, an unencrypted resource at the other end, uh, the traffic on this last hop is unencrypted and uh, some people have made news for uh, setting up sniffers at Tor exit nodes and uh, if they were in the US they'd be violating the Wiretap Act, collecting information on the transiting uh, traffic and then saying, we've broken Tor. Um, well, they've broken a uh, feature that wasn't designed into Tor in the first place and that uh, in fact is disclosed on uh, in, in our, all of our documentation uh, as something that we unfortunately can't protect against. Uh, well, it turns out all of these uh, encryption uh, layers are good at uh, censorship resistance uh, because if uh, you're sending encrypted traffic past your national firewall or past your uh, ISP trying to block you from access to particular sites, um, unless they are blocking all encrypted traffic uh, or unless they are uh, very good at detecting uh, the Tor signature, uh, your traffic will get through. Uh, and so here, uh, Tor has a metrics portal showing uh, all of the uh, suitably anonymous data that, uh, that Tor collects. We invite researchers to come in and uh, analyze this data. This is uh, what was happening in Egypt around the time of that internet shutoff. So you see, just before uh, the internet went down, word was getting out that the internet may not be safe to use unencrypted. Um, you need uh, to use something like Tor to protect your traffic. Uh, this is at metrics.torproject.org uh, if you're looking for uh, the metrics portal. Uh, so you see a big spike in traffic, uh, then suddenly it goes to zero uh, when the internet is cut off, uh, and uh, then it picks up again to a slightly higher level uh, than uh, it was before the cutoff, as we hope uh, more people have, have taken to heart the, uh, the, the network security issues around uh, using an internet uh, when you don't know all of the parties uh, involved in providing your service. Um, now, Tor is uh, not a magic bullet uh, in these situations. Uh, recently uh, ran into a problem in Iran uh, where uh, suddenly the traffic went to zero uh, over Tor, uh, even though uh, elsewhere their internet connections uh, were still functioning. Uh, we discovered that they were blocking Tor, uh, based on the particular prime number being used in the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Uh, and they were, they, uh, so this told us first, they had enough computing power at their uh, national connection points to watch all of the encrypted traffic for that key exchange. Um, and then they were able to selectively turn down uh, the amount of Tor traffic going through uh, to a trickle or zero uh, to, to stop that. Um, now, it turned out that uh, while we had used what was uh, an RFC standard number uh, there, nobody else seemed to be using that, so it was pretty safe for uh, the government to, to block it without interfering with other traffic. Um, we switched to the one that Apache uses, um, and because they didn't want to block all Apache SSL traffic, uh, we now see connections to the Tor network from Iran again. Um, China takes an even uh, a different approach to, to blocking uh, Tor. Um, and it's seemingly able to watch 
uh, enough connections and browsing patterns to identify all of the entry nodes into the Tor network uh, and block each of those by uh, IP address and port number combination. So a lot of the Tor network uh, is public and you can uh, yourself browse for uh, a list of entry nodes. Uh, you can look at a list of exit nodes and if you want to block Tor traffic uh, from entering your network or using your resources, uh, Tor provides uh, the list of published exits. Uh, but because some people don't uh, don't want to allow access to Tor uh, from on the incoming basis, uh, we set up uh, what we call bridge and entry nodes. Um, and if you a, a bridge is just an unpublished um, entry node, so you're not getting it from the public list. You're getting it from uh, another database. Some of these are distributed uh, by uh, email robots. Some of them are distributed a few at a time on web pages. Uh, some of them are distributed through other social networks. Uh, give a, a few to somebody to post on Twitter or to distribute uh, as he or she uh, might choose. China seems to be blocking even these after a couple of days of operation. So you start up an unpublished uh, bridge entry node. Um, you get give the address to a few people um, in China. Um, they might share it or use it and share it with others. For a couple of days, it functions, uh, and then traffic drops. And if you move it to a different port, uh, it'll function for another couple of days there. Uh, but uh, there's some pretty sophisticated surveillance and blocking going on. Uh, and these are open research questions, places that we are trying to uh, work on determine how to disguise the traffic better, how to disguise the entry points better. Um, we're working uh, currently to modularize the uh, entry point uh, so that uh, people could change the, uh, the, the transport in this first talk. They could tunnel it over some other connection mechanism. Uh, if Skype traffic can get Un, uh, block, un, unblocked out of the country. Uh, perhaps there's a way of tunneling the introduction uh, over uh, Skype or some other protocol. Uh, and our idea is to uh, modularize that architecture so that anyone who has some, a, a transport layer to plug in uh, can offer that uh, without having to change the, the, the back-end Tor network each time. Uh, rather to say, once you've fed some traffic into the network, we'll re uh, return it to the same point and uh, let you organize that first hop. Uh, we also uh, see efforts to crowdsource the reporting on censorship. Uh, so this is the Herdict product, uh, project uh, out of the Berkman Center, uh, named for the verdict of the herd. Uh, even though, as has been pointed out, sheep flock rather than herd. Somebody liked the name, and so uh, Herdict lets you, if you are trying to visit a page and find you can't access it, Herdict lets you report that. And it doesn't assume one way or the other the reliability of your report, but aggregates that into reports from uh, around the world uh, to show you. Well, you reported Facebook blocked, but a uh, hundred other people reported it as accessible from your country. Uh, maybe it's an ISP level block. Uh, maybe it's just down or there's some routing problem along the way. Yeah, question? Are there censoring countries that block heard it or it's not as popular for them to bother with it? Um, so far, we seem to be getting reports from China and uh, from other censoring countries. Uh, so that's a good question of uh, whether they started to make this a target um, from the, the data that I see here. Uh, I don't think so. It may, but it may be because this hasn't yet gotten to be a, a large enough project to, to attract their attention. And it doesn't offer you access to the resource on the other side, uh, only tells you whether or not uh, others uh, have found it 
to be accessible. So uh, then part of that is to collect a, a pool of data about which we can say more, um, analyze the trends of, in censorship, and uh, help people to think about responses that might uh, give them access to these resources. All right, so we got um, sort of censorship um, out elsewhere outside of the United States, political censorship at uh, forces on internet service providers, either through law or through uh, political pressure. Uh, what about here in the US? Um, are we free of uh, these kinds of intermediary interference? Uh, well, we had uh, a posting uh, by WikiLeaks of uh, some US embassy cables uh, a while back. And uh, you might, um, WikiLeaks began on uh, November 28th to publish uh, a selection from among the uh, 251,000 uh, cables that had been leaked to them. And the US State Department was uh, unhappy that its cables had been leaked, and various others uh, in US government uh, were not so happy. Um, so if, if a few days later you tried to visit the, the cable gate page, um, you might find uh, it block, or you might find um, it not appearing. And um, the, the chain from here to there uh, is a little bit uh, less direct. Um, so one um, point in the uh, chain uh, was this guy, Senator Joseph Lieberman, chair of the uh, Homeland Security Committee. Uh, who uh, made a few calls to uh, Amazon, which was hosting WikiLeaks in its cloud service, um, and reportedly asked, are there plans to take the site down? Um, this site that is, uh, and Amazon Web Services, uh, which advertises itself as cost-effective, dependable, and flexible, uh, decided that in this case it didn't want to be quite so dependable. Uh, that uh, maybe it was, uh, and the, afterwards they said it wasn't that Senator Lieberman put pressure on them, it was just their terms of service. Their terms of service prohibited uh, posting of material you didn't own. Uh, because after all, we don't want to be hosting people's uh, infringements of copyright or theft, and WikiLeaks didn't own the cables that uh, had been leaked to them. Where uh, and because this is a private service and uh, not a government actor, and because the terms of their uh, contract with individuals they host are up to them to set, and they left they giant provision in there giving them discretion to uh, choose not to host somebody who didn't meet their terms of service. Um, Amazon torn between political pressure on one side and lots of traffic to a site that uh, they didn't necessarily want to defend, uh, pulled the plug on sort of the cloud storage of uh, the WikiLeaks cables. Um, every, yeah, but I think this is an interesting and important point to debate because, <clears throat> I mean, idealistically, we might want Amazon to stand up for WikiLeaks. Probably many of us in the room would want that. But, I mean, uh, I mean, w c could then you equate that to, like, if, if Amazon had accepted, had allowed WikiLeaks to host other people's content, what happens with um, somebody hosting other people's music or illegal file sharing. I mean, is there a difference or is it, does it become the same thing? Then, then they can't block um, sites that are violating copyright. So is there, is there a connection between copyright violation and can you consider the information, the US government secret information to be kind of related to copyright in some way? Um, they're basically, as a private party, they're free to choose 
uh, each time. Um, they're, they're not bound by precedent in the same way uh, that, that a court or government actor uh, might be. Amazon could choose to make a distinction. We will allow the WikiLeaks material to stay, but we will forbid people from posting copyright infringing material. They could structure their terms of service. And the terms of service is a contract between Amazon and its end user. It's not enforceable by the outside world, uh, so nobody else can uh, sue Amazon for failure to comply with its terms of service. We can sue them for other things like facilitating infringement of copyright or uh, if um, if you push it, conspiracy with the release of uh, secret government cables, uh, but um, they're not bound to enforce that contract. Well, and as a private company, I mean, they can they can terminate your services. They don't like want you to on your web page or the way you sign the check. I mean, like it's a private company. They can if they. It, it, there's enough leeway in their terms of service that if, if they don't like what you're posting, they simply say goodbye. That's right. Refund um, your money and move on. We tend to, I mean, if, if we think about it from a um, First Amendment perspective, uh, while we would like to think the First Amendment gives us the right not to have our speech restricted, uh, that right is only good against the government right. uh, or state actors, not against private parties. Um, and so even if you had a watertight agreement with Amazon, even if you had an agreement that says, you promise to host my content no matter what, uh, I pay you a million dollars and bond against any uh, fees that somebody might charge you for hosting my content, um, they could still choose to breach that contract. And you could sue them for breach of contract, but you wouldn't have a First Amendment case against them. I guess if I try to focus the, the question, if Amazon were posting somebody else's copyrighted material and found to be benefiting from that financially, as I understand it, they can be held legally liable, um, at least civilly yep. and perhaps criminally. Is there an argument to be made in this case that by posting the WikiLeaks material, they could be held criminally liable? I, I think not. I think it would be a real stretch um, to say that the hosting of material that's alleged to be um, criminal in nature is uh, a violation. In fact, we have specific protections for uh, sources who have le lawfully obtained material, even if it was unlawfully obtained in the first instance. So. Um, the Supreme Court uh, several years ago heard uh, the, the Bart Nicky case of a uh, radio host who had found a tape in his uh, mailbox uh, that was obtained by wiretapping uh, some uh, a cell phone conversation. The wiretap and the recording of that cell phone conversation clearly unlawful under the Wiretap Act. The radio host receiving the tape and rebroadcasting it clearly protected speech under the First Amendment uh, the Supreme Court said, even though they had reason to know that it was obtained unlawfully in the first instance, because they had done nothing wrong in uh, taking it and reposting it. The, the piece of statute that attempted to criminalize their uh, activity was ruled unconstitutional. I saw several questions come up. I was going to say, it's, it's also worth keeping in mind the other economic perspective, that there were a number of individuals who did not agree with the WikiLeaks posting the cables, and thus Amazon could also have potentially taken a hit to their profits from hosting this. Thus, does that does that hit to the profits outweigh how much they're getting paid to host WikiLeaks? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that comes up uh, in well, what every DNS uh, did in response. Uh, they found that they were getting uh, too much traffic to their name servers, which were hosting uh, the WikiLeaks.org uh, domain, or were performing name resolution uh, for WikiLeaks.org. Uh, and they said, uh, you're violating the everydns.net acceptable use policy. Members shall not interfere with another member's use and enjoyment of the service. Uh, which basically amounted to, yeah, we don't want to expend the resources it would take to continue hosting this service. We have a get out of jail free clause in our contract, uh, and we're exercising that. 
So I just wanted to clarify. So it's, it's illegal to knowingly take possession of stolen goods. The stolen information that you knowingly take possession of is legal? According to that Supreme Court case you cited? Because the, the, the information is uh, protected under the First Amendment. But he knew that it, was, that it was illegally obtained in the first place. He knew it was illegally obtained. And the, court, the court did add a uh, sort of uh, a clause that this was information of public concern. The, okay. the people in the phone That's, conversation were talking about a, uh, a union fight, and the, the court found this conversation could be relevant to the public's consideration of that political matter. So if it were merely a theft of trade secrets um, or something that didn't have the same pu public concern, we might see a different that, that's, we also the, that's also a distinction that's made in terms of uh, stolen property. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. Right. Did uh, Joseph Lieberman actually threaten Amazon with any specific kind of legal action, or was it just sort of like a failed, vague kind of thing? He. Um, from, from the reports that have come out afterwards, uh, we don't see any specific threat. We saw him put out a press release taking credit for uh, Amazon coming down, um, and we have reports that he said things like, are there plans to take the site down? Uh, because he would run into First Amendment problems if he explicitly said, I am acting as a government um, in, in my uh, position of authority, and I'm demanding that you remove uh, this material. That would cl cross a clear First Amendment line. This, we don't think it's a good idea. Are you sure you want to antagonize the chairman of the Department of uh, the, the Homeland Security Committee? Um, it's harder to, to challenge that. Uh, so, and uh, under similar pressure, uh, PayPal. Stopped access to the WikiLeaks account uh, and stopped accepting donations on uh, its behalf. Uh, Visa and MasterCard uh, ceased their services, um, all without anyone ever telling them you are forbidden from doing this. Did other credit cards too, I was curious, did like Discover and American Express also? I don't know if they were ever American taking. American Express didn't have a payment service. Uh, I think pay MasterCard. Visa and MasterCard both did. Um, I'm not sure if there were any other channels that uh, would have been available. Um, and, of course, this didn't stop WikiLeaks. Um, you can now find WikiLeaks at uh, wikileaks.ch, among other places. Um, and uh, if you go to uh, wikileaks.info, uh, you'll find their attempt to uh, guard themselves against that kind of takedown in the future. Uh, so here they are telling you a whole bunch of other domain names at which you can find their site, um, not only by domain name, but also by IP address in case somebody tries to knock out the DNS resolvers uh, again. Uh, you can go uh, to any of those listed IP addresses and find uh, the WikiLeaks site. So again, this is the uh, distributed net organizing against that uh, centralized pressure. WikiLeaks had billed itself as a distributed uh, place to leak your information. Uh, it turned out to be a more centralized organization than uh, it had billed itself, but in the face of a centralized attack on its uh, accessibility, it was able to federate. It was able to stash its data in lots of different places um, and invite people to contact any of these uh, decentralized versions of the WikiLeaks website. Um, and this is a pattern that we've seen uh, be before when copyright holders try to take down uh, movies or uh, keys uh, from the net. Uh, they often find that all they've done is sparked a proliferation uh, elsewhere even after uh, cutting off a, a, a single central source. So I want to talk uh, a little bit about some of the other places uh, that we see censorship uh, operative or other mechanisms that look an awful lot like censorship. 
So if just before the uh, Super Bowl last year you had tried to visit the uh, website rojadirecta.org, uh, which is a website that offers uh, access to streaming video of sports broadcasts from around the world, rojadirecta.org uh, was owned by a company based in Spain. Uh, this is their uh, website at rojadirecta.es. Uh, and uh, they had gone to court, uh, been taken to court by uh, copyright industries in Spain, and found to be operating a legitimate lawful business. Uh, this is their website. They link to lots of streams of content that are uh, unwanted by the, their copyright holders. But uh, the, the Spanish courts ruled Roja Directa uh, cannot be uh, sued for those links to third-party content. Um, but that didn't stop the uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, International Customs Enforcement, ICE, went and seized the domain name. Um, and uh, this, the statutes that they're citing here uh, are asset forfeiture statutes, typically used to seize something that you think is going to uh, disappear before you can bring a litigation. Uh, so if you, uh, in law enforcement, are pursuing a drug smuggler and he's got his drugs stashed in the Ferrari, you can seize the Ferrari. Uh, and this is why you sometimes see court cases captioned $250,000, United States versus $250,000, or United States versus the Ferrari, uh, because the action is uh, titled an in rem action against the thing that you've seized. And as you might expect, when it's the United States versus a pile of money, the United States usually wins. Uh, How is this a homeland security? <laughs> um, well, they assert that piracy is dangerous to uh, national security, and that because this is information coming in across our borders, it's a customs enforcement matter. <laughs> and if it doesn't make very much sense, it, to what national security plan, what powers it threats national security? Yeah, the, uh, uh, I, I think they make trade arguments, and um, sometimes, uh, I'm not, I haven't seen it here, sometimes they argue that piracy is often linked to criminal activity or conspiracy. Don't be uh, the terrorists. <laughs> to terrorism, to child pornography, anything we can uh, lump together. Has that actually been President would hold up? Well, this, so they've done a series of uh, these seizures, and uh, some of the, the people whose domains have been seized are thinking of challenging it. It's only happened um, uh, in the last year. Uh, that we've really seen these um, on a, a large scale uh, against uh, claims of copyright infringement. Uh, so we're uh, going to, I, I hope, see it tested uh, the, and uh, and see what the how well justified it is. I, among those whose sites were seized, uh, one in another round, what torrent freak. Uh, dot com was uh, run by an Egyptian who uh, was linking to other material around the net, including news and including uh, torrents of, uh, of music downloads, authorized or unauthorized. Uh, is it proper to use US-based DNS uh, and uh, domain name infrastructure to stop these sort of foreign sites? Like they were able to go after rojadirecta.org uh, because .org is run by the Public Interest Registry, uh, which runs its operations out of Virginia. Uh, so they use that sort of vague tie to US jurisdiction, and it's a real, uh, real US jurisdiction over the company, to say, you must stop your domain name from resolving because we have seized it, lest it run away. You mentioned this is this is for the seizure of physical goods that were part of, of some criminal activity. 
the, the statute doesn't uh, refer specifically to the physical. It refers to seizure um, of instrumentalities of crime. And so they argue that the linking to copyright infringement is an instrumentality uh, of crime. And in order to uh, stop it, we'll take the domain name. So just a note, but I, I remember seeing an ad campaign, like you went to a movie theater and watched a movie. Um, they would have this short ad from the NPAA about piracy and how piracy feeds terrorists. It's like that's where they're getting their money from. Of course, that might be questionable, but I, I think this is how they might justify such a notice, saying that this money is going to terrorists, so this is a DHS issue. I, yeah, I think um, all of these maybe uh, a piece of it. So let's see here. I want to get through a few more uh, examples. Um, uh, so uh, going on in parallel to these domain name seizures uh, are debates in Congress over the Combating Online Infringements and Counterfeits Act, uh, which would designate internet sites dedicated to infringing activity uh, and empower the attorney general to go after them at any level of the domain name resolution. At the domain name registrar, uh, who sells the domain name, at the domain name registry, who runs the .org or .com or uh, .biz, um, or at any internet service providing run provider running resolvers, or at anyone providing advertising services or financial services. Uh, so this is trying to strike at every branch on uh, the tree uh, connected to infringing uh, or allegedly infringing uh, content, um, raising concerns about uh, does this destabilize internet infrastructure if, uh, if people are now returning bogus results to DNS queries, if for example, the uh, registry is outside the United States and the registrar is outside the United States. So if you're trying to go after rohadirecta.es, um, if you're telling US internet service providers you must not resolve rohadirecta.es, what sorts of clutches does that force them to introduce into their systems? Uh, how is that going to break other traffic? Is it uh, just going to cause more people to flee to overseas hosting. Uh, will it have uh, any effect? Um, and will Congress pass it anyhow because they're not listening to any of these concerns about the, the, the technical feasibility or um, unintended consequences of this uh, type of legislation? Uh, and so that was last Congress. The bill died there, but uh, this Congress uh, is holding new series of hearings and uh, still trying to go after um, websites dedicated to stealing American intellectual property, uh, told in very uh, grave-sounding terms, but uh, not necessarily targeted well at, at the problem that they're trying to uh, combat. I'm going to go through one more um, example here of uh, censorship at a different layer. Uh, this is um, everybody's favorite copyright infringer, uh, Senator John McCain, who uh, during the presidential campaign um, put up uh, videos in a YouTube stream and uh, offered his campaign advertisements there. And if you tried to visit that YouTube stream, Stream in October uh, 2008, you would find a uh, notice on several of the videos that uh, this video is no longer available due to a copyright claim. Um, what was the uh, infringement? Yeah, question? Well, it's just um, there was another case that came up just recently about a, a reporter being sued for violating the copyright on his own article. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a technology site that, that was sued, and, and they had a field day with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, I, so copyright law prohibits the reproduction or uh, distribution or uh, creation of derivative works or public performance of somebody else's copyright without authorization. 
Um, the authorization can include fair use, which is uh, the provision uh, permitting you to use somebody else's copyrighted work um, in uh, for purposes of news reporting or commentary or educational uses. Uh, if your use is transformative uh, and it doesn't take too much of the copyrighted work at issue. Uh, and uh, so McCain had used snippets from Fox News and the Christian Broadcasting Network um, in campaign advertisements to show himself or his opponents or the anchors uh, commenting on those performances. And he'd taken it to make a political advertisement among the uh, the uh, core protections of the First Amendment is political speech. Uh, so again, if this were a government-ordered take uh, town, it would be clearly illegitimate and unconstitutional. But when Fox News and Christian Broadcasting Network filed copyright complaints with YouTube, uh, saying this video infringes our copyright because it has copied some material from us, YouTube's response was, fairly automatic to remove the material. And McCain, Palin campaign wrote to YouTube arguing, this must be a mistake. You don't realize what you've uh, done. This is a political campaign. You realize how important it is for us to have our videos posted. Um, the need to prevent meritless copyright claims from chilling political speech is decidedly not new. Uh, we must prevent copyright from interfering with political candidates' free and full exercise of their First Amendment rights. Um, sounds great at stirring defense of fair use principles. Uh, YouTube's response was basically a, we're sorry, we're compelled to take this material down if we want to preserve our safe harbor under uh, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, now, they're not precisely compelled to. The law uh, says that a service provider uh, shall not be liable for damages if, upon receiving notice of claimed infringement, uh, the provider acts expeditiously to remove the material. Uh, and it sets up ways for copyright holders to notify of claimed infringement. Um, so it doesn't say that the DMCA and the rest of copyright law isn't crystal clear on what happens if someone who is hosting user-posted material doesn't remove on the claim of infringement. And back to the question earlier uh, whether service providers could be liable, there are different ways that they could be liable. So someone who knowingly and actively contributes to the posting of infringing material can be held liable uh, under contributory copyright infringement. Or someone who uh, makes money off the direct provision of infringing materials uh, and makes that money and has the right and ability to control the uh, infringement uh, can be held liable under doctrines of vicarious uh, liability. But if they didn't know it was uh, infringing, didn't make any money specifically off it, they weren't running advertisements alongside the McCain campaign's advertisements. Um, and even if they were notified uh, it, and then gained knowledge, uh, it's not clear that they'd be held liable for uh, having uh, automatically offered hosting there. I see questions. Is it possible, though, for YouTube to not take down first and ask questions later? I mean, it seems the way it's worded, it seems that they have to take it down while the investigation is underway, whether you can file a counterclaim or not. Um, is so the, that the, case? the law says expeditiously. It doesn't right. define expeditiously. Uh, so it could be um, immediate. It could be a week while you try diligently to investigate. Well, it could be like two months during the entire investigation and counterclaim and whatnot. Um, it, that's no longer expeditious. That's probably <laughs> stretching it. And then, uh, as you know, the law sets up a counterclaim mechanism and explicitly says about the counterclaim, you must leave the material down for 10 to 14 business days after you've received a counterclaim. So um, McCain could have counterclaimed uh, against the takedown, but it was already mid-October. By the time 10 to 14 business days passed, um, he's lost the election. Uh, so 
That time scale doesn't work very well for somebody who is trying to engage in speech. It does uh, give the person who's complaining a chance to file a lawsuit if they want to argue that, no, in fact, this material really shouldn't go back up because uh, it was infringing our copyright. So YouTube says, um, we, we, we can't possibly investigate each of these cases individually, uh, and so we need to adopt a blanket policy of taking down and then giving the, the users the opportunity to counter notify. Um, they invite Senator uh, or President McCain to help them combat abuse of the DMCA, uh, including, by way of example, strengthening the fair use doctrine, uh, something that I encourage Sen Senator McCain to take up uh, now that he's back in the Senate, but uh, haven't seen him do. Uh, so I know we're running short on time. Uh, I'm going to be happy to take more questions afterwards. Let me uh, just wrap up with a few more uh, notes. Um, and uh, one of those is that uh, sort of the, the Chilling Effects Project uh, takes one what a, a user side means of combating DMCA abuse. Well, we can't prevail on YouTube not to take things down or Google not to remove things. Uh, we can at least publicize the, the effects uh, of takedown demands. Uh, and so Chilling Effects uh, collects all of the takedown demands sent to Google for their uh, search and their blogger products. Um, collects all of the takedowns sent to Twitter because people complain to Twitter that somebody is posting a link to a copyrighted uh, work in the 140 characters of a tweet. Uh, and Twitter removes those. Uh, but they send the material, the complaints on the chilling effects uh, where we publish them. So that, so, and then uh, when somebody does a search on Google and would have retrieved uh, a blocked result, Google removes the result, encouraged by the, to do that by the DMCA, but includes a link at the bottom uh, saying, uh, for more, one result was removed from your search. For more information, uh, click here uh, to see the complaint, which takes you over to the chilling effects page, uh, where we have posted the complaint uh, along with analysis and explanation of the law, so that somebody who wonders, why can't I find out how to download Avatar the movie uh, from Google, can at least see that it was Fox Pictures complaining to Google, demanding the removal of links. And uh, this is why uh, Google complied under the DMCA. Uh, now, it turns out, in fact, you can still find plenty of ways to download Avatar the movie on Google, uh, because for all of the complaints that Fox Pictures sends out, more pop up. And uh, again, the, the distributed net has uh, often won out over the uh, centralized uh, attempts to take down. So I think I'm going to uh, wrap up the, the formal presentation here and uh, invite anyone who wants to stick around for further questions. Uh, and uh, I welcome further questions, research interests. Chilling Effects also has a, uh, a big database of, uh, we're now up to about 50,000 takedown demands. Google has uh, been getting more than 300 every day lately. And that's not even counting YouTube stuff. Uh, this is demands for removal of links from the search engine and posts from Blogger. Um, and uh, we are making that data available and hoping, uh, working to do some research on it ourselves and also uh, inviting other researchers with interest to, uh, to come through it. and. Uh, see what is being taken down, how much of it is these sorts of political uh, takedowns that would be fair use, how much of it is competitors demanding that their competition be taken down for copying a two-word product description, which we see, or a DMCA as black hat search engine optimization, which are competitors are uh, alleged, uh, accused copyright infringers, they won't show up. Um, and how much of it is just ineffective because the movie studios can keep sending takedowns against postings of movies, uh, but 
uh, it, they keep being reposted. Um, so um, the, the edges are often able to overwhelm the, uh, the pressure on centralized choke points. Um, and uh, it's my hope that more of these projects, projects like the Freedom Box, projects uh, like Diaspora to build an edge provisioned social network uh, can help us to take power back to the edges and uh, to, to fight against these centralized forms of control. Thank you.